Hello again guys. So uh, I'm starting a new series today uh, which is not going to concentrate on me building uh, another computer from scratch from hardware but instead we're going to have a look at uh, an existing piece of hardware, an iconic piece of hardware which is this uh, IBM personal computer um, which of course is the basis of uh, pretty much all personal computers which are around today in 2020 and uh, so uh, whether you're running Linux like I am or uh, even if you're running a MacBook or if you're any kind of Windows PC or, or really 99% of, of all possible kinds of desktop and laptop computers, even most of the servers which are around today, uh, they can all trace their origins back to, to this machine, which was the original IBM personal computer. And that came out in August of 1981, so that's almost 40 years ago. Now, why am I focusing on this model? Well, the reason is that uh, a lot of the architecture and, and, and the, the way things are organized inside modern PCs uh, traces its origin back to this computer and to some of the decisions that uh, the engineers at IBM made when they first put together this computer. Now, of course, this isn't the first computer that was ever built. Uh, it's not even the first personal computer that was ever built. In fact, there were a number of personal computers which existed and which were even commercially successful before this uh, IBM PC was brought to the market. Um, but uh, all of the different uh, personal computers uh, and, and other kinds of computers which were around at the time, they all had their own sort of personal architecture. A little bit like the, that uh, tiny little computer that I built on breadboards. Um, tons of architectural decisions I, I made while I was going along and, and had to do with uh, the way I organized things and the kind of parts I could get and, uh, and the way I wanted to organize my computer. Uh, and, and that generally was the situation uh, in, uh, let's say, the late 70s and, and very early 80s uh, when every computer manufacturer basically put together a computer based on some CPUs and some peripherals and they were all linked and organized uh, in a particular way which was specific to, uh, to each manufacturer. And of course IBM, when they brought out, brought out their personal computer, they did exactly the same thing. So they also made some decisions. Uh, and so to, to people in August of 1981, this uh, IBM personal computer was a new computer with a new architecture. In fact, it had a new uh, CPU. It used the Intel 8088, which hadn't been around for very long at the time. Uh, and so uh, anybody uh, at the time who, who acquired one of these computers uh, and wanted to start using it, in particular wanted to start writing useful software for it, would need to uh, find out how the computer was organized and, and uh, what bits of the architecture and setup were relevant for writing software. And, uh, and that's simply the way things were in the 80s. And so that's kind of my goal in this series, is to, uh, is to take a step back and to pretend that we're in 1981 and that we've uh, just bought this uh, brand new shiny IBM personal computer uh, and that we are now uh, want to get familiar with it and try and understand how it works um, and, uh, and, and try and write some software for it. Now, I'll be focusing most of all on the, on the very first personal computer that IBM brought out, which uh, had the model number 5150. So the IBM 5150 personal computer uh, came in a number of different variations. Uh, and so the, the, the version which you can see here on the screen has two floppy disk drives, um, but there's no hard disk. In fact, none of IBM's personal computers, which came out in 1981, had any hard drives. That, that was simply not a technology that was available for personal computers at the time. Even these floppy disk drives were uh, entirely optional. So you could buy an IBM personal computer with no disk drive at all. Uh, and if you did that, uh, then essentially you, you had a little bit of boot software on a, on a read-only memory inside on, on the motherboard of the computer. And that would start up a basic interpreter. In fact, that's what you can see on the screen right here. This is, uh, and all you can do with that is uh, run basic programs. And you could even save and load programs uh, using a cassette tape machine, which you could connect to the back of the computer. Uh, but that's really all you could do uh, if you bought the basic model with no floppy disk drives. 
Um, and then, of course, you could add some options, and a, a very popular option was to add these floppy disk drives, and, and, and that allowed you to do something which was uh, unheard of at the time, which was to run uh, an, an very serious program called an operating system. In fact, uh, because it operates on disks, uh, it was called a disk operating system, or a DOS, which of course later on uh, became abbreviated to DOS, and, uh, and is nowadays is an is a, uh, um, integral part of computer folklore, is the, is the story of DOS itself, of the first disk operating system. So yeah, we'll be having a look at that as well, and uh, and essentially, at, uh, at, uh, we're going to try and find out, uh, in the way that uh, a software developer or a, or a computer enthusiast in 1981 would have had to find out about this computer, about everything you could do with it, and and in particular how you could start writing software for it. So uh, how would you begin with a task like that? Well, uh, this being an IBM product on the one hand, and generally the spirit of the era on the other hand, uh, means that uh, there was a, a very different approach to, uh, to a technical information and to documentation in general uh, at that time than there is today. So today when you buy a computer, say you buy a new MacBook, uh, you'll get maybe a leaflet with two or three pages in it which says you can do this and this and go to the Apple website for more information and that's it. And um, there, there's no supposition that somebody who buys a computer uh, can in some way d program it in, in a useful way. The situation is even worse for uh, phones and tablets and things like that. And uh, back in, uh, in the 1980s that was, uh, th there was a totally different approach. And so when a computer manufacturer, in particular a, a big one like IBM, uh, brought a new piece of hardware onto the market, uh, they were expected to document it thoroughly. And uh, IBM did exactly that. So uh, when you bought the PC, uh, you would get a whole stream, a whole ream of uh, documentation manuals that uh, essentially came with it, which were part of the product. And so here we see a few of them. And uh, so what we're going to try and do is see if, uh, based on the information that we can we can find in here, and uh, trying not to use any information that we know about today, about uh, DOS and uh, PC hardware as an architecture, see if we can simply use the information from this available documentation and maybe inside some of the programs and tools to find out uh, about this machine and to see if we can, if we can get it to do what, uh, what we want it to do. So, uh, the, so you can find uh, copies of these manuals on, uh, on a website here, a very interesting website called PC JavaScript. Uh, it contains not only manuals, there are actually emulators of a lot of uh, uh, hardware here, including the original IBM PC, the, the one that we're going to look at, the 5150. Uh, but it also contains, this is the interesting part, uh, uh, PDF versions, scans essentially, of uh, all of these different uh, bits of documentation that came with the original PC. And so we'll be able to read those. Uh, so that's one source of uh, information that, that we'll be using. Um, it will obviously be wanting to try out some of the software that came with uh, the uh, with the uh, IBM personal computer. So especially if you had a disk drive and you you uh, some of the products you had to pay, but there were nominal fees like forty dollars or something like that uh, to get some of the products which are around. Uh, for example, the operating system DOS. Uh, you could also get some programming languages at the time, and uh, we'll be trying some of those out. And so they generally would come with their own disks and with their own manuals. And so some of those disks have also been scanned, and so we can, uh, one source of, uh, there is a, a little bit of the software available on this site. Uh, another site that has a lot of software from that area is a site called WinWorld PC. Now it has a lot of later software as well, but so we're interested specifically in the, the very first versions of software. This, for example, is, is PC, Personal Computer Disk Operating System which is the very first version that there ever was of what later became uh, DOS. Of course, everybody knows this is a Microsoft DOS because Microsoft was in fact the company subcontracted by IBM to write the disk operating system. And uh, subsequently, Microsoft started selling their software to uh, other computer manufacturers. And, uh, and that, that's of course a well-documented story. But uh, back in 1981, the only way to get hold of this product of, uh, that Microsoft wrote was to buy an IBM personal computer and to buy the DOS that came with it, the very first version. 
And so we can download disk images and, and we can, you can run those uh, in this emulator, which is provided on this site. Um, or you can, you can run them on, a, on, an, em, on a, uh, an emulator which you have locally. Um, another important source of information is this site, uh, which is minus zero degrees. That too has a lot of the manuals. In fact, some of the manuals uh, are available here, which I couldn't find on any of these sites. Um, and it also contains a lot of information and tips uh, for running the actual hardware, if you should have it uh, today. So uh, since mm, these machines are going on 40 years old, some of the hardware in there um, ages better than some other. Now, in general, um, the machines, if they're, if they're well maintained, uh, they were built to last. So IBM was a, uh, an engineering company that, uh, that put a lot of uh, pride, let's say, in durable engineering. And uh, so it's a testament that uh, some of these IBM PCs are actually still running today, 40 years later. But of course, extra care is needed, maybe a little bit more care is needed today than would have been in the early 80s, uh, simply because of the age of the components involved. So for example, magnetic disks you know, they don't last forever. Uh, some of the electronic components, in particular the capacitors um, are on the motherboards in these computers, they need some special handling. And so this site has a lot of tips about, uh, about how to uh, uh, run uh, one of these computers today and, and how to um, uh, take good care of it. Now, I don't actually have uh, the original hardware, and I th honestly, to, to try stuff out and to, to be messing around with software, I think it would be a little bit irresponsible to use vintage hardware. So we're going to use an emulator. Uh, but we're not going to use this emulator in JavaScript here. Uh, I have an emulator on my local machine. And uh, it's a program called PCEM, so it's the PC emulator, and it's, uh, it's freeware. You can download it. This is the, the Linux version. But I think it exists for uh, for modern Windows and for um, Mac OS as well. And so I've gone ahead and set up uh, the hardware configuration for the original IBM personal computer, the model 5150. Uh, let's just have a look at the config here so you can see. So it has the AT88 processor, uh, which will be running at its native 4.77 megahertz speed. So we can get a feel of uh, not only how where we can find information, but what it was actually like to write software and, and to uh, discover and, and work with one of these computers back in 1981. Uh, we're actually going to use a, a model with 64 kilobytes of RAM, the first models that uh, IBM brought to market. They had a motherboard which could hold between 16 and 64 kilobytes of RAM. Kilobytes. So uh, if, you, if you think about uh, the number of gigabytes of RAM that we have in modern computers, um, it's uh, quite ridiculous to, to be working here in kilobytes. And so uh, 64 kilobytes was the maximum amount of RAM that you could put on the motherboard uh, on, of, the of the first version, first iteration, let's say, of the IBM personal computer, the one that came out in August 1981. They had a few later models which were able to handle 256 kilobytes of RAM on the motherboard, but uh, we'll be using the original with 64. Now, it was possible to add more RAM, even on one of the original motherboards, but that uh, involved installing an expansion card. So uh, just as in modern PCs, at least desktop PCs, the original IBM personal computer also had uh, modular expansion slots, and you could add up to five expansion cards in there to uh, you know, give you extra capabilities. Now, these days, we use that to, to add things like uh, if you still need one, you could add a modem card, uh, or lots of people have uh, very sophisticated uh, graphics chips, for example, on expansion cards. Um, if your computer, if your motherboard doesn't have USB support, you can add a USB card and stuff like that. Um, and this was true of the original IBM PC as well. And so one of the expansion cards you could add back then was an expansion card to give you even more RAM than uh, what you could fit onto the motherboard, which was this maximum of 64 kilobytes. Um, we won't do that to start with. We'll uh, just start out with a maxed out motherboard. And we'll have the monochrome uh, video card, which you can see here. And the monochrome card can only handle text. It doesn't handle graphics. And it's also, I think, the card that, uh, that most people, especially business people, would have bought 
because uh, it had the corresponding monitor which was produced by IBM. You could get a graphics card, the infamous CGA graphics card uh, that was available for the original IBM personal computer, but you couldn't use that with an IBM monitor because IBM didn't produce a monitor uh, that was compatible with its uh, CGA card. And so you would have to use that with either a television set or some monitor which was compatible with the card uh, delivered by some third party. And in general, the text was simply of a lesser quality using that graphics card. And uh, so we'll be using a, a fairly standard configuration using the actual uh, IBM. Well, I'm not using an actual IBM monitor, but I'll be emulating an actual monochrome IBM monitor in this PC emulation program. And we'll be using uh, two floppy disk drives, uh, which is the setup that uh, uh, you can see in this picture here. So two floppy drives. Remember, we have no hard disk. So the floppy drives are all we have to have any kind of permanent storage. If we want to store files or anything like that when, while we're programming, we'll be using the floppy drives because that's, that's the only kind of permanent storage the machine has. As I explained before, you could also use a cassette drive and you could actually save and load information from that drive um, but that was a painfully slow process even compared to floppy disks I mean today people find floppy disks extremely painful but uh, the, the cassette drive was rumored to be even more tedious and so we'll be using the floppy drives all right so that's the emulation configuration that we've set up in this program and uh, so that allows us to actually uh, start up the emulator and uh, so here it is and here I can see what I have in the floppy drives and at the moment I have nothing connected to either of the two floppy drives and so as you can see the emulator boots uh, straight into a basic interpreter and that's exactly what would happen on the original IBM in fact that's what you can see on the screen here in the screenshot it's the uh, the the cassette this C stands for cassette um, a basic interpreter which is loaded straight from the ROM in the computer. So if you had no disks at all in the drives, or if you had a model which didn't have any disk drives, this is how your computer would boot up. So that's the basic uh, premise of, uh, of this series of videos that I'm, I'm planning to produce, where uh, we'll be emulating the original IBM PC model 5150 with two floppy disk drives and 64 kilobytes of RAM. And we're, trying to, we're going to try and use the technical information that IBM supplied, uh, wherever we can find it, in whichever manual of the manuals we have here, to see how we can start uh, programming in, uh, in different environments uh, and how we can start uh, producing useful software on this, uh, on this very first personal computer. And we're going to try and do it from the standpoint of a, of a developer in 1981 who obviously has no prior knowledge of PCs because this is the very first one. And so the entire architecture of this machine is brand new. And so that's, that's, uh, that'll be our starting point. So in the next episode, we're going to have a look at what's maybe the easiest of the programming environments that uh, IBM provided, which is the basic environment, which we, we actually already have running here. Um, it's uh, so easy that as soon as you turn the machine on with uh, no floppy disks, you're, you're essentially you land straight into that programming environment. And uh, as, uh, as is tradition in programming, what we'll be doing in the various environments is our, our, our challenge is going to be to get the string hello world to appear on the screen in, uh, in different uh, programming scenarios. And so that'll, that'll be our yardstick if we like. And so we'll we're going to try and uh, use uh, each of the programming environments and, until we can get uh, Hello World to appear on the screen. And so, uh, yeah, in the next episode, we're, we're going to do that in BASIC. So, see you then.